I spend with Jesus. Sweet is the presence of the Lord, and sweet is the way He gently takes me by the hand and helps me down the road that leads to home. Hello and welcome to the Pastor Speaks program. I'm Michael Wartman. I'm the Associate Pastor of Open Arms Ministries, which is actually located right downstairs from the studios of WTJR at 224 North 6th Street. And if you don't have a church home, we'd like to invite you to come and worship God with us. We have services on Sunday morning at 10 a.m., and Wednesday evening service at 7 p.m., and all are welcome. Well, today I'd like to talk to you about the will of God. You know, the will of God is the plan of God. There's a, a verse in the Bible. I didn't look it up. I happen to know it by heart, but it says, There's a way that seemeth right unto man, but the end of that is death. And so we need the will of God. We need to know the plan of God because it's everything about the will of God. In Luke chapter 15 and verse 10, Jesus said this, Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. That means when somebody comes to the Lord and repents, and turns from their way and turns to God's way, that means there's one more opportunity. This is why all of heaven rejoices. There is one more opportunity for Christ to be displayed in this world. You know, I've been hanging around uh, this building for uh, quite a while now. I can't remember now, 13 or 14 years. I used to work here at WTJR. I'm still a part of KJIR Radio. And I, and I want to tell you that before every program, every local program that you see on, that is produced and recorded here at WTJR, I can tell you from experience that before Donette or anybody starts anything, they always grab hands and they pray. That's because they want the will of God. We've got to have the will of God because when Jesus said in the model prayer, when they were the disciples asked, how should we pray? He used the phrase, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. So we need the will of God. It's not, it's not about us displaying our abilities, but it's about God displaying His abilities through us, the church. It's God the Father through God the Holy Spirit displaying God the Son in a vessel called the church. You know, when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane before He was going to be crucified that night, he was in that garden and he was praying. And he said this in Matthew chapter 26 and 39. I'm just going to take this little excerpt out of that. He said, Oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. You know, there. That, that is something that every Christian has got to come to. Every Christian has got to have that Gethsemane experience where you decide in your heart, you know it's going to be tough. Jesus knew what he was getting ready to do. He knew he was going to go to that cross. He knew he was going to suffer mightily upon that cross. You know, he was fully God and fully man. So when he was on that cross, he suffered just like you or I would have suffered if we were on that cross. And he, he decided, he said right then and there, God, not my will, but your will be done. And so that is what has to happen in every one of our lives. We have to decide right here and now 
that I'm going to serve God no matter what. I'm going to serve God even if there's no money in the bank. I'm going to serve God if there's no food in the fridge. I'm going to serve God if all my friends have deserted me. I'm going to go on with God and I'm going to do the will of God. And that is what Jesus did in the garden. He made that declaration and that is what you and I have to come to. He said, if it's possible, let it pass from me. There's nothing wrong in asking God to let something pass from you, you know, if you don't want to do it. But yet, not my will, your will be done. It's all about the will of God. You know, we were made in the image of God. God has a will, and God gave you and me a will. God's not going to force you to do anything. It's only as we will to do His will, then He works in us to enforce that will by the power of the Holy Spirit. Which brings us to our scripture today, and I'd like to read from Matthew chapter 7, and starting in verse 13. Now, this is... The, the ending of how Jesus ends the Sermon on the Mount. And this is Matthew chapter 7, starting in verse 13. It says here, Jesus says this, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. So broad is the way to destruction. And then we read in the next verse, because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. There is a way, and the way that he's talking about here is the will of God. We've got to follow God. We can't go with the crowd. It's easy to go with the crowd, but according to what Jesus said, you're going to go with the crowd, you go with everybody else, you go with what's popular, you go with whatever, you're going to go the way of death. But we go that narrow way. We take that narrow path. We follow Jesus. You know, Jesus is, is the embodiment of what heaven is. He is a, he is a different order. When you, when you look at Jesus and you follow Jesus, everything's different than the way of the world. And he's saying, straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life and few there be that find it. I'm going to go on here in verse 15. It says, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. He's, what he's saying here is that not everybody, and we're, I'm going to get down here, we're going to go down here a little bit further, not everything that calls itself Christian is Christian. You've got to discern what's right and what's wrong. You've got to stay so close to God that you know what's right and what's wrong. It isn't a wide path, but it's a narrow path. He says, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth forth not good fruit is hewn down or cut down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. You can't get good fruit from a bad tree, and you can't get bad fruit from a good tree. Which brings me to what Jesus said, that you must be born again. He told Nicodemus that you must be born again. You must be born from above. That old nature can only produce bad fruit. That new nature, which is born of God from above, can only produce good fruit. When you ask Jesus to come into your heart, when, when that, that, the miracle of being born again happens in our life, God, by the Holy Spirit, produces that new 
creature, that new nature inside of you. We're born again of incorruptible seed. It says that in the book of, uh, I think, 1 Peter 1.23. It could be 2 Peter. But we're born again of incorruptible seed, born of Christ. And when we're born again, there's two natures that's going on. You've got the old nature and the new nature inside of you. That's when the battle starts. Before I came to Christ, before the miracle of the new birth took place in my heart, there was no problem with sin. I sinned because that's who I was and that's what I did. But when I got born again, there's the controversy. I got this new nature from God working inside of me. So you have those two things going on inside of you and whatever nature you feed, that's the nature that you become, whatever you feed. Now, I want to go back. I want to go down there. That's why it's so important to follow the will of God, because if you follow that old nature, if you follow that old man, you're, gonna, you're not going to end up in heaven, because it says here in verse 21, Jesus said this. Now, folks, I'm not making this up. It says this in my Bible, and it says it in your Bible. In verse 21 of Matthew chapter 7, Jesus said, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, uh, says, Not everyone that uh, says, saith unto me, I lost my place, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Wow, that is some powerful words. What that is saying, what he is saying right there is, Not everybody that calls me Lord is going to make it to heaven. Wow. And then he goes on to say, but he that what doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Those who call Jesus Lord and do his will will make it into heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils. And in thy name done many wonderful works. And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquities. Now, folks, I, I said that before. I, didn't, I don't make this up. This is in my Bible. This is in your Bible. And it is a stern warning for every one of us who calls ourselves Christian. If we are Christians, we're going to be following the will of God. We're going to be seeking His will all the time over our will. Remember what Jesus said? Not my will, but thy will be done. We've got to come to that place, I, I remember I said, where I'm going to do everything it takes to follow you, God. It's not my will, but it's your will that must be done. He says, to those that did not do the will of God, he said, I never knew you. Wow. He said, I, I don't know you because you don't know me. Jesus said this in John chapter 17 and verse 3. He said, and this is eternal life. This is when he's praying to the Father. He said, and this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Those who do his will shall enter in to the kingdom of God. And you said, do his will. How do I do that? What am, what am I supposed to do? What are you talking about here, about doing his will? Well, I want to... Go to Matthew, another place in Scripture, and we're going to go to Matthew chapter 16 and verse 15, and this is going to explain it a little bit more about what we're talking about here. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 15, you have Jesus with the disciples, and Jesus says this, He saith unto them, But whom... Say ye that I am. And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Bajona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee 
that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. There you have it. Jesus asked his disciples, whom do, whom do uh, you say that I am? And they made that declaration, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Anybody that goes to church has, has basically made that declaration. Every church out there, you can go to any Christian church out there and you can stop anybody that walks out of that church and you can ask them, who is Jesus? And they'll tell you, the Son of God. They'll make that declaration, the Son of God. But that's not, that's not enough to just make that declaration that he is the Son of God. Remember what Jesus said, not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. He's talking about church folk, and it's not enough just to say that Jesus is Lord, but you're going to have to live like he's Lord and live like he's Lord over every part of you, that he is the Son of God, that you're going to do his will. Because we read on verse 20, Matthew chapter 16, then he charged his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. And then verse 21 says, From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and raised again the third day. Now here's Jesus telling them plainly what the will of God is. Do you hear me? Jesus is telling his disciples right here that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Now you see, that's not this old nature's idea of victory. That's not the old man's idea of, 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 of how we would beat the devil, to allow ourselves to die like that. To, but that is the will of God. And then in verse 22, we have Peter. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him. Can you imagine that? Peter rebuking Jesus. Jesus has explained to him what the will is of the Father. And then so Peter, who is a follower of Christ who loves Jesus. You know he loves Jesus. He's following him. He begins to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, for this shall not be unto thee. He didn't want it to happen that way, but it's the will of God, and the will of God is not always the easiest way to go. But I want to tell you, it's the right way to go. Verse 23 Jesus, and but he turned Jesus and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. He just got done saying, he just got done saying how blessed uh, Peter was for him knowing that Jesus was the Christ and how the Father had revealed that to him and how he was a rock and how he was going to build his church upon, uh, upon the testimony of what Peter had just said and how the gates of hell were not going to prevail against it. But Peter says no to the will of God. He said that, no, I don't want you to go and, and be crucified. And, and that's understandable because in our mind, in the mind of man, that does not seem like it would be the right thing to do. But Jesus said, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou art an offense unto me. For thou savest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Then said 
Jesus unto his disciples. And now, here's where we have to come, folks. This is where we have to come so that the will of God is worked out into our lives. He says here in verse 24, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Isn't that what Jesus did in the Garden of Gethsemane? He denied himself. He said, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. But yet, not my will, but your will be done. Because Jesus knew the will of the Father was the best way to go, was the best plan that there ever was. And so many times, we want to take the easy way out. So many times, we want to take that wide path like Jesus was talking about. So many times, we want to, the, the, he, said the, he said, broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. So many times, we want to take the easy way out. But Jesus says it leads to death and destruction. There's a narrow way that leads unto life. And you and I have got to follow that narrow way. We've got to deny this old man expression so that Christ can be expressed through you and me. We have to deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow him. Every day, every day, you got to put on your shoes, get up out of bed and say, not my will, but your will be done. I've got to follow Christ. He's got to be. And it says here in verse 25, Jesus saying, for whosoever will save his life shall lose it. You can go ahead and take the, take the same path that everybody else is going. You can take that whatever popular path it is. But Jesus said, you go ahead and save that wretched life and you're going to end up losing. It says, for whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. If we deny ourselves, you're going to find eternal life. You're going to find that eternal blessing. You're going to find something so much better than what you have ever thought of. Because you're going to have eternity with Christ. For what is a man, verse 26, for what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. I didn't make this up. It's in my Bible. It's in your Bible. Jesus said it, that he shall reward every man according to his works. If we deny ourselves and we follow him. Now, you know, flesh cannot crucify flesh. I'm not talking about some sort of, an, of a, 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 oh, I don't know how to say it. Some sort of a tense, uh, mean kind of existence. But I'm just talking about laying before the Lord every day and saying, Lord, I surrender to you. Whatever you want to do, do it. Not my will, but your will be done. Take care of me, Lord. Show me the way. Let my path, let my steps be ordered by you. It's not a mean, uh, fast, everyday type of existence. It's just yielding yourself up to Christ and letting him be number one. Sometimes it does mean we got to fast. Sometimes, uh, most of the time, we got to shut off the things of the world. But I'm telling you, we've got to be followers of Christ and not of self. For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. Verily, I say unto you, that there be some standing here which shall not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. God's will is God's plan. And his plan is always better than our plan. 
You remember Moses? You remember the story of Moses? You know, Moses was an Israelite. And he was raised up in Pharaoh's house. And he, he knew that he was strategically placed by God to deliver the children of Israel out of bondage. Well, he decided to take things into his own hands. He decided he had a good plan. And when he was about 40 years old, he murdered an Egyptian and got found out about it, realized, got scared about everything, and took off running. And he left. And there he lived in the desert for 40 years. Here he is, an 80-year-old man. He, he thought he knew what was right. He took things into his own hand. He, took, he did his plan. Wasn't following God's will, but he did his plan. And now he's an 80-year-old man out in the desert, and he figures it's all over with for me. But you know what? Now he's at a place where he's so weak, the only way it's going to work is God working through him. And when he was 80 years old, God called him to deliver the children of Israel out of the strongest nation in the world at that time. That was God's plan. It was God's will that he, at 80 years old, would do that. In Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 7, it says this, Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord, and whose hope is the Lord is. For he shall be as a tree planted by waters that spreadeth out her roots by the river, and shall not see when heat cometh. But her leaf shall be green, and shall not be careful in the year of drought. Neither shall cease from yielding fruit. The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give to every man according to his ways, and according to the fruit of his doings. You know, it's got to be the will of God. Not my will, but your will be done. And finally, we read in 2 Chronicles 7, chapter 7, verse 14, If my people which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Time sure has gotten away from us today, but it is the will of God. Jesus said that not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he which doeth the will of the Father which is in heaven. Seek God's will. Turn to him. He will reveal himself to you. God bless you. And sweet is the way he gently takes me by the hand and helps me down. My heart was born a blank slate, ready to be written on, to be filled up with the language of love. That's what I believed. I was wrong. My heart was a rock, an unmovable object, a stone temple for loving only myself. My heart was untouchable, unable to give unable to feel what mattered most.